Man, I love it. I'm so excited about this series. Did you love the uh, video intro? That is one of the few intros we've ever had where people get excited, start shouting and clapping during the intro when that dragon's, and that guy's just going like this. I love it. Didn't you love the new song, Unshakable, too? Wasn't that an awesome song? Really, the song preached the whole sermon so we could go home. Yeah. It's been good seeing you today. Now, I am really excited about this series. You know, the scripture says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, it says, let's keep our eyes on Jesus, who both was the beginning and the end, who finished his race that we're in. It says, study how he did it. Study how he did it. So that's what we're going to do in this series, is we're going to study how he did that. And it says, because he never lost sight of where he was going, he was able to put up with anything along the way. You know, in life, storms come, don't they? In fact, I saw the weather report that said there's some storms that are supposed to come through the St. Louis area today. Storms happen. They happen to good people. They happen to bad people. Storms come. Jesus said, not if storms come. He said, when they come, what are you going to do? Well, in Luke chapter 6, there's a verse that... I've heard all of my life, but boy, it is so appropriate for when life gets tough and when life gets rough. And it's this, Jesus is talking about when storms in life come, make sure you have a good, solid foundation. A foundation is what holds you strong during a storm. And he says, what your foundation is, this is good for all of us in Joy Church, what our foundation is, is the word of God that his word goes into our heart. It builds a foundation that keeps us so strong as we go through life and as the situations in life come. And then he says, the other part of the the verse, he says, if you don't have a foundation when those storms come, they will destroy you. They'll tear tear you apart. So when we hear the word, we've been talking about this on our midweek services. I've really enjoyed teaching that uh, short series on the midweek where we've talked about the famous verse that says faith comes by hearing, hearing the word. But we often stop there. When you look at it in the context, the whole chapter of Romans chapter 10, it's not that just faith comes by hearing, it's faith comes by hearing the word preached. The whole thing's talking about a preacher preaching the word. And that's one of the reasons that it's so important to come to church and to hear our preachers. And we've got about five of them that are just incredible here Enjoy Church is growing, our team is growing, you're growing, and God is doing some incredible things here. But why is it important? Because without faith, it's impossible to be pleasing to God. And without faith, it's impossible for you to move outside of the circumstances, those circumstances that hold you captive, but also the storms in life to make it through the storm so that you have a testimony on the other side of that storm that you're going to get through it. And you are. But when you hear the word preached, don't miss church because you never know when you're going to hear the word. It's not just hearing once. It's the hearing continually of the word that builds your faith. But the scripture says when storms come, they do come. And what I'm going to do is we lay a foundation in this series. Storms come basically in three areas and storms always threaten us, don't they? The big, the big threat behind a storm is the fear of loss. Think about these three areas. One is relationally. Don't we fear that sometimes relationally, like, you know, and the storm of someone betraying you? The the storm of someone walking out of your life, the storm of losing someone in death, that's relationally. The storm of someone just pulling away from your life. So there's a lot of ways that storms can come relationally. You can have, you know, friction in the marriage or in the relationship, the partnership at work. Financially is another one. Think about this, the material goods and the fear of loss, the fear of losing your house, the fear of losing your job, the fear of financial destruction. A lot of times people experience those fears in life. And those are storms. Those storms come. There's loss there sometimes. And the other one, the third one is health. Think about your health. People will spend the first part of their life living however they want. You think your health will always be there. I used to eat whatever I wanted. That was 40 pounds ago. Now I watch everything because I'm going like, oh, what what was that? (laughs) 
I've never felt that before. Can anybody relate to me? And then when you get older, man, you're spending money on health stuff like crazy now. Like I'm buying vitamins and nutrition and you can do all kinds of stuff for your health and spend your money. So you, you try to make your money so that when you're older, you can spend your money on staying young again. That's what we do. So storms come and health, you know, like your health, the health of your family, you know, and sometimes the enemy will threaten us with fear, the fear of losing your health or the fear of, you know, someone that you love. I love what the scripture says in John 16, one of my favorite verses, but I love it out of the message Bible translation for us today, because it says, I've told you all of this so that you can trust me. You will be unshakable and assured. Don't you love that? My prayer for you is that through this series, we're going to, we're building the foundation, but over these next few weeks together, we are going to become stronger and stronger and stronger in our faith that we literally, it's not going to be theory. It's not going to be some cute religious saying, we are going to be unshakable. Come on, that no matter what we go through in life, we're not shaken by it. I love the word assured. The word assured is a faith word. It means to be confident, so confident in the boldness of God and his word that you're just assured. You might be right in the middle of it. A thousand falling at your left, 10,000 falling at your right. But you're like, I'm coming out of this thing. I'm not wishing with, oh, I wish, I, I sure hope I make it. That you have some experience. Experience brings hope and hope makes you not ashamed to where you're able to just say, I'm going through this. We're getting through this. So I'm really probably more excited about this series than you are right now because I know what you're getting ready to hear. And it's going to be good for your soul, good for your soul. So <clears throat> this verse is a verse that I thought of that kind of explains, it ties what we've been talking about on midweeks and what this series is really all about. Proverbs 15 verse 14 says this, the mind, how many of you know the battle when you're in the storm is your thinking? The mind of him who has understanding seeks knowledge and inquires after and craves it. That's you guys. It says, but the mouth, everybody know we just finished this series, our big fat mouth. I want to call it my big fat Greek mouth because of the movie, but <laughs> it's not Greek. It's big fat mouth, right? Our mouth can get us in trouble by what we say. But watch this. He gives the rest of the verse. It says, verse 15, all the days of the despondent and afflicted are made, made evil. They're not evil automatically. What makes a day evil is the anxious thoughts and the forebodings. Now, forebodings is not a word you typically use all the time, right? You don't walk around and go, what are you doing? I'm foreboding today. <laughs> Let me share with you what I believe the scripture is talking about and why the mouth. See, all of us, we're Christians. We know Jesus. We're going to heaven. We're going to go there someday. But right now we live in the world, don't we? There are storms in this world. And because we've lived in them, uh, we have anxious thoughts and sometimes foreboding. What foreboding is, is it's the opposite of what faith is because faith is the substance of the things you hope for. It's the evidence of the things you don't see, so you're not seeing it. But what a lot of us do at the end of our day, we come home and we rehearse everything bad that happened through the day. We rehearse it. We tell our spouse about it. Man, I got a dent in the car today. This happened. My coffee spilled on my lap. And we rehearse. And those things really did happen. They really did. But we rehearse them. We rehearse them. And the more you rehearse something, the more you establish it. My dad always taught me. He said, Darren, you get in life what you expect. And the way you build your expectation is what you rehearse out of your mouth. What words of wisdom was that? That was incredible. And some of us accidentally, because we all come from a flesh background, we're all in the process of being saved. We're saved going to heaven, yeah, but we're allowing the word to transform and renew our perspective the way we think. And what we end up doing is we give attention, mental attention. This is called foreboding. We give mental attention. We run mind movies, movies in our mind. You all know what a movie is, right? I think the only reason the Bible didn't use mind movie is because movies weren't invented yet. But it does use the word image and faith and imagination and the picture, the way you see what your vision is. Habakkuk says there's a vision. 
So I like to bring it up to modern day stuff. I think if Jesus was teaching, he'd tell a parable about a movie. And many of us run movies of fear and loss and their perspective of what bad might happen. And then out of that, we complain and whine. And I know I'm not stepping on anybody's toes. I'm just (laughs) teaching you so you can go teach somebody else that you work with how to have a good mind movie because you're all playing a mind movie. You're all having self-dialogue. But if all that comes out of your mouth is everything that happened and you rehearse this and you rehearse that and you talk about this and you talk about that and you talk about that, you're going to get more of what you talk about. So for us, the days are made evil by anxious, fearful thoughts and forebodings. Foreboding, just picture it this way playing those mind movies in your mind of everything that's wrong, what possibly might happen. Now, they'll come. They'll show up. They show up in my life all the time. I'll get an image or or a thought of something that I never want to happen. And what I've learned to do, I'm learning to do this more and more and get better and better at it, is instead of, instead of just going with it, for sure, don't speak it out of your mouth. That's right. That's right. But instead of even letting it go, I take that thing and I go, oh, no, I reverse it. So, devil, you want to try to play that game with me? I will play it right back on you, buddy boy. I am going to reverse it. So whatever that negative thought is, I reverse it and just say, if, I'm go- if you're going to make me imagine something that hasn't even happened yet, then let's play the imagination mental game I'm going to go ahead because I'm a dreamer. God made me to have an imagination. And because I'm sitting in the word, hearing the preaching of the word over and over, then I'm going to go ahead and by the power of the word, I'm going to go ahead and dream and run a mental mind movie of what I'm believing God is going to do. So if he's threatening you with taking your money, oh, I just played a movie of getting a raise. I just, play, I just played a mind movie of inventing something and going like, who would have ever thought of that? Me. You want to use your imagination? Don't let the devil use it on fear or loss. Turn that thing around. Are you with me so far? Well, don't rehearse those fearful thoughts because the enemy will try to beat you up. So where do storms come from? A lot of people are confused and they think that all storms come from one location. No, no, no. They come from four different places. And maybe it's good to know where it came from. It's a good question to ask. Don't spend a whole lot of time on it, but just know this. They come from four locations. Number one, the number one cause of storms in my life is me. It's the enemy in me. It's me. It's Darren Karsten's Galatians says this in chapter 6. It says, don't be deceived. God is not mocked. For a man will reap whatever he sows. Sometimes the storms that are happening in my life is because I made some very bad choices. And I'm reaping a harvest. I made some bad thoughts. Some bad words came out of my mouth. And I made some bad decisions and choices. And now I'm reaping the harvest of that. Come on, let's be honest. We cause a lot of our own storms to happen in our life, but it's so easy to go, it ain't my fault, it's my wife, it's my husband, it's my kids, it's my boss, it's the economy, it's this or it's that. No, 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 a lot of it is for me. I caused some of this stuff, right? Colossians says in chapter 3, verse 8, rid yourself completely of anger, rage, bad feelings, curses, slandering, foul mouth abuse, and shameful utterances out of your mouth. So he's saying, watch your mouth again and watch what you do because a lot of those things that go, my anger, my rage, you know, a lot of that stuff can cause a storm to come back in my life. Are you with me? The second thing that can cause a storm, and it's okay to realize this, you live in a fallen world, you live in a broken world. This world is messed up, isn't it? I mean, the world's upside down because of what Adam and Eve did. The world, the Bible says that The world is waiting for the sons of men to be revealed. What's that mean? It means that the world is waiting for you and me to take our place in the kingdom and be who God created us to be. We are overcomers. We are champions. We are victorious. Instead of being under the circumstances, know that we realize who we are. We get that image in our heart, and then we be that person. We act out 
on who God created us to be. Amen? You're going to be that person. The world has fallen. The world's broken. It rains on the just and the unjust alike. Did you know good things happen to bad people? Sometimes you ever know somebody that's just rotten to the core and just some good things happen to them? Well, we just live in a world where sometimes things happen like that. And did you know somebody that's good and sometimes bad things happen to them? That happens too. But I know this, what I want to encourage you to do, and that's what we're going to do in this series, is we're going to learn how to take our place in the covenant that God has for us. There's some promises of God, isn't there? The third way is that Satan causes them. How many of you know you do have an enemy? The scripture says in 1 Peter that he prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for whom he may devour. Can't devour everybody, but if you're in the posture and the position where he can get you, he will get you. Well, we're going to teach you through this series how to move yourself from that place where he can roar, but he can't get you. Amen. Three amens. Everybody on Facebook, amen? Thank you. Yeah, you're going to be able to, you're going to be able to hear the word. The word's going to build faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. You're going to hear the word. You're going to move in a position where you live as the overcomer. Victorious, right decision. And look, when you do mess up, not if you mess up, when you mess up, don't beat yourself up. Sometimes we just count the losses and we count the mistakes and we count them in our subconscious. Don't do that. You will stay a victim. You will see yourself. It's not how you see yourself in your conscious. It starts there, but it's how you see yourself in your subconscious. You are a victor. You hear that enough. You meditate on that enough. You play that mind movie of the picture that came from the word and your imagination of who you are in Christ Jesus and your behavior will change to that. This is on my heart to share with you. We talk about goals. You know, we always, every year, we talk about setting goals and dreaming big. And there's the, the, the first thing that comes to most people's mind is the goal of getting new things. I want to, I want to start a business. I want to get a new job. I want to Get a new house. I want a new relationship. I want whatever it is. Or maybe it's a doing goal, like we're going to go to Europe this year. I want to go to Hawaii. I want to take the family on this vacation. And those are all good. But the best goal, in fact, this goal that I'm getting ready to share with you is the key that will unlock the possibility of you getting those other two goals. And that is to start setting first as a priority being goals. So where you run that movie, it's not just a movie in your mind of me going to Europe or going on vacation. Those are fine. But the way you're going to get them is that you're going to begin to see yourself playing that movie of who God says you are in his word. And now I was a shy person, but because he said, hey, Gideon, you mighty man of valor, that God put that in the Bible for me and for you that now we begin to declare his word over our lives and we begin to see ourselves. I don't care what I used to be. I don't care. You know, maybe you were addicted to pornography. Maybe you were addicted to some substance. But let me tell you, it's not, don't focus on that. Whatever you focus on, you get more of. Focus on what the scripture says, who God says that you are. And you begin to play that every day in meditation. Joshua 1.8, meditate on the word day and night. The scripture says in Deuteronomy, talk about the word with your children. Meditate on the word. Talk to them day, night, and during the evening. Talk about it. So what, you're, you're, what, what, what we're doing with this is we're playing that, and then we're talking about, by the way, the word meditate means to mutter. <laughs> So what it means to mutter is instead of rehearsing all of the negative that happened through the day, begin to mutter how good God is all through the day. Uh, instead of saying this bad thing happened, this bad, God fed me today. Man, that burrito was good. It was good. Hey, if anything, if anything good happened, I'm giving God credit for it, right? Mm -hmm. thank, thank you, Lord. I was able to fill my gas tank up today with gas and and thank you, Lord, for this, and thank you, Lord, for that. And then the promises, those things you're believing for. 
I'm a man of confidence. I'm, I walk in confidence. I've got an assurance, not in my flesh, but in who I am in Christ. I'm an overcomer. I'm, 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 I'm muttering. I'm an overcomer. I'm an overcomer in Christ. Man, our praise and worship at church is good, isn't it? Oh, yes. Friendly people at church where things are good, things are happening. I'm muttering the thing I'm believing for. And watch, those around me, they hear me muttering that stuff. That's meditation. Play that thing over and over again. Yeah, Satan tries to get you, but be alert. Realize it, recognize it. Let me give you the fourth one. This is a little confusing sometimes, but a good parent, a good father will put their children through, through a few tests. Now, let me clear up something that you might have heard that sounds very religious, but it is very wrong. Probably like me, have heard preachers say that if a sheep wanders out of the pen, a good shepherd will go break the leg of that sheep. That is absolutely not true. I did some research on that, and there's never been historical recording in history or today of a shepherd that breaks the leg of their sheep. We put people in jail today for that kind of physical abuse. God does not do things for you that he's already paid for. He paid for your healing by his stripes and by his wounds, you were healed. Why would God put that on you when he's already paid for it? I hope that wakes you up because you serve a good God who's not against you. Now, he will discipline you like a good father, right? Fathers discipline their children, not punish them. Punishment, discipline, two different things. Punishment is what we do to criminals. We punish them by putting them in prison. Discipline is different. Discipline is encouragement with a little bit of correction, sometimes hemming in and protecting. We strengthen the fence. We strengthen the encouragement. We set stronger boundaries for our children. That's what God does for us as well. Sometimes, though, the test, and we view test as hard. How many of you were in school love test? Anybody? Anybody? Raise your hand if you love test. There are a few test takers that are like, I love test. Okay. Few. But for the most part, I am assuming, since you did not raise your hand, that you did not enjoy test. But Jesus tells us in his word, get encouraged when you go through a test because of what the test produces. That when God allows us, and God doesn't necessarily put the test on you, but when the storm comes, we are automatically tested in our faith. Automatic, it's a byproduct. Whether you caused it, Whether the world caused it or whether the devil caused it, God says, all right, I'm going to use this opportunity as a test, and you have the opportunity to pass the test and get promoted. So he says here, he says, for a little while, 1 Peter 1, 5, you may be distressed by the trials that you're facing so that the genuineness and the quality of your faith may be tested. Your faith is more infinitely valuable and precious than gold as it is tested by the fire that you go through. Church, some of you are in some purification right now. Don't resist it. I, don't, I mean, you resist the devil, but allow God to take you through it victoriously. James says it this way. He says, consider it pure joy. Now, joy, that seems just like such a tall order to me, doesn't it? I'm going through a storm. Consider it joy? Yeah, the reason he says, and he puts a word in there that just baffles me, pure. Pure means pure, pure, pure. Pure joy, consider it pure joy. That's talking some massive joy. Pure joy. It could be, he just could have said, consider it joy. Like, it would have been like, huh? Pure joy is like, woohoo! 
That's an attitude of the heart. You don't have to walk around being weird. <laughs> but it's an attitude of the heart that's like, okay, I'm going through this. Why would I do that? Watch. Because whenever you face trials of many kinds, you know this, that the testing of your faith is developing perseverance. Oh, perseverance, as it finishes your work, makes you mature and complete, not lacking anything. So in other words, when you learn how to persevere, whatever promises are yours through the covenant, you get them because you know how to persevere through a storm. You're going to make it. And you get a confidence. And that's why I say being goals are so much better. The being of, I am being perseverance, uh, per persistent. I'm committed. I'm not wishy-washy. I am committed, right? I'm, I stick with it. I'm victorious. I said this, so you play this image in your mind of what the ideal, mature character, the disciple of Christ producing the fruit of the Spirit is. Someone who walks in love, joy, gentleness, peace, temperance, who cares about others first. So the being goal, and using my imagination to just mutter through life going, man, I care about people. I love people. I forgive people. My focus is on others before myself. I'm so confident in the Lord, I'm going to make it. I don't have a self-arrogance, but boy, I've got a confidence in the Lord. I eat problems for lunch. <laughs> Come on, you need to begin to say that about yourself. I am an overcomer. I am victorious. That's, that's me. That's me. Say it with the boldness of the word. No confidence in my flesh. Paul said, I take no confidence in my own self, but in him, I am able to do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So don't play the blame game, okay? Move into this and consider it pure joy that you go through some things because that means if you go through it, you're coming out of it. How do I do this? Well, you hear me say all the time, attitude is everything. But what is really attitude? Attitude is the perspective with which you have. See, if I've got a negative attitude, and all I do is rehearse everything that's wrong. I tell everybody about it. What I'm doing is I've got a perspective. But what we can do to become overcomers, to have unshakable faith, is to move our perspective to this side and just look at it differently and go, okay, it is inconvenient, but here's what I do know. This is going to be a great testimony for the Lord's goodness through me. I get to be a participant in showing how good God is as I stick with this and walk in faith and develop the maturity. And I get a perspective, a good attitude of how good God is. Are you with me yes. so far? Proverbs 3, 5 says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and don't depend on your own understanding. That's why I'm in church, getting my faith renewed. Remember the Lord in all that you do, and he will give you success. How many of you want some success? I love to talk about the covenant of God. Instead of focusing on the storm and the problems, I'm going to focus on the covenant that God had. Because of what Jesus did at the cross and the blood that he shed, the price that he paid, there's a covenant that I didn't earn, I'm not worthy of in the natural. But because he paid for it, I am worthy of it. Did you hear all the amens on that? Just a couple right over here. It is so hard. Do you know what humility is? A lot of people have a misunderstanding, a wrong definition of what humility is. They think humility is going, I'm, I'm a horrible dog. I'm not worthy. I'm nothing. Well, we already knew that. <laughs> Me too. But what true Sacrificial humility is. Sacrifice means you trade something of lower value for a higher value. And what true humility is, is when you humble yourself to who God says you are, his viewpoint. Humility means you come up under the authority of something in your life. I humble myself to serve the authority. It means this, that if God said, I paid with my blood and your sins are forgiven and you're righteous, you are a child of God. You're my child. You belong to me. And here's what he's saying about you. He's saying, you are worthy. I have made you righteous. I have made you righteous. I have imputed it to you. It is a gift you cannot earn. But I want you to begin to out of your mouth and with your mindset, I want you to begin to see yourself as the righteousness, not just here, but in here. That that's who I am. That's who I am being. I am being the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. 
Now when you get up and you walk through the day and the devil tries to beat you up with another failure, you go, I don't care if I've had 20,000 of those failures. God says he did one thing one time. He paid for me. He purchased me and he made me righteous. That's who I am. That's my ID, my identity. When I pull the ID out and I show the devil the ID, it doesn't say Darren a failure. It says Darren, the righteous man of God in Christ Jesus. You have been made righteous. You are righteousness. That's who you are. I love this verse. It says, Revelation 3.21. He who overcomes, how do you overcome? By embracing the word. By the way, he calls you an overcomer. He who overcomes, I will grant to sit down with me on my throne. Most of us would say, well, I'm not worthy to sit on the throne. Think about it. The throne of God? Jesus, where is he right now? He's at the right hand of the Father, sitting on his throne, interceding for us, praying for us as we go through storms. And as you and I realize in our faith heart, our identity of who we are, that we are overcomers and we are worthy to sit on that throne, not at any worthiness of my flesh, but because of the work he did, it's all a work, it's all a gift. Guess what? You're going to sit on that throne someday. In fact, I love the verse in Ephesians that says, he has made us to sit with him in high places. Right now, spiritually speaking, your position is a little different than your condition. Your condition is you're in this body and you're sitting in church. Maybe you got a few aches and pains and maybe you're hungry like I am right now. I just realized I'm so hungry. That's my condition. But my position spiritually I'm sitting on the throne with him. Someday, someday when we leave this earth, we will literally be there with him on the throne. He's going to share his throne. Mind-boggling. He's going to share his throne with you. It's kind of good to imagine that too. Maybe imagine your children sitting on the throne. Pastor, that's hard. Those kids are crazy. Picture it so you have faith for them coming to the Lord and walking with the Lord. And being, but some of us need to see it for ourselves. Are you with me? You're an overcomer. That's who you are. So keep your perspective. Keep your vision. The vision comes from the word of God. That's why we hear the word. We hear preaching. The lights go on. We're looking for something. Maybe that's why you came to church. You're looking for something. You're wanting hope. You're looking for it. You came. And the lights come on, revelation. When the lights come on, you can see things finally. You got a vision. But one of the things I love about it is you always see other things you didn't even know that you were looking for. Like, my goodness, I dropped my phone, but I found some French fries. <laughs> I didn't know they were, I had dropped these fries last night and didn't realize it. They're still good. <laughs> That happens with the truth of God's word too, though. You, you see things in God's word that you didn't see as the light comes on. When you're hearing the word and faith comes by hearing it, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And you need faith to reach for those things that don't exist yet. Not just with the wishing, but with a confident expectation and assurance. This will be mine someday. I will walk in this. And the way to get that is to see the being part of my personality, not just the getting and the doing. Fine. But I've noticed when I walk with God, oftentimes because I delight myself in him, he gives me the desires of my heart. Oftentimes the desires he gives me are different than the desires I had before. I wanted, wanted all the stuff, but that was the greed of my flesh. Now what I want is what he wants. And I'm going to see it and you're going to see it as well, too. So keep your vision because your vision is what gives you the energy and the passion to be and then to do. Where there is no vision, Proverbs 29, 18, the people perish. You've got to have a vision. You've got to hear the word. Keep your vision. Keep believing for it. I'm just going to be honest with you a little bit. My dad died at 65 years old. And I hate it because I wish he would have been with us for another 15 or 20, 25 years. But one of the things he told me in those last few months of his life is he says, Darren, I could in my faith fight this. You know, he had a cancer situation come up and he said, I could fight this. I could believe God to overcome this. But 
He said, you know what? I really don't have any vision left. I've done everything I've wanted to do in life. I've, I've passed the church off to you already. You're leading. He said, there's a lot of things I could do, but I don't have a vision for it. And at 65 years old, he went home to be with the Lord. I feel like that was too early. How many of you feel like 65 is way too young? Come on. The older I get, the younger it is. <laughs> too young. I always encourage people, hey, if you're going to retire, don't retire from something, retire to something. It means this, that you can leave a job, but you better have another vision of another job, another kind of work. By the way, if you're retired, the church is a great place, man. We've, you get involved here. Amen. Keep your vision. Keep your passion. Write that vision. Habakkuk 2 says, write the vision. Make it plain. Write that out. Play that through the meditation of what you got from God's word. Play that godly vision over and over in your mind. Meditate. Put it to good use. Play it. Remember the word that Abraham got from God? You're going to have a son. Years go by. He could have quit. The verse says in hope, Romans 4, 18, in hope against hope, he believed. What does that mean? Well, let me get real practical. He's 100 years old. Things didn't work. And guys, they didn't even have the blue pill at that time. And yet, at 100 years old, that was funnier than you responded. <laughs> and yet, people are afraid to talk about sex in church, but... It's where you ought to talk about it, right? I learned all the stuff about sex on the playground from a kid named Andre that was two or three years older than me at sixth grade. He had failed a few times. He's in, he should have been in the 10th grade. He's got all of us sixth graders around saying, okay, here's the way that it is. Let me just tell you, Andre wasn't right. But nobody else taught us. The church should have taught us some stuff. They were scared to talk about, though. Your pastor ain't afraid to talk about it. <laughs> May save your life or your kid's life talking about it. Abraham against hope had hope. And then his child was born. Let me just share this with you. We're still laying the foundation just for a minute or two. Feed your faith. I feed my faith every time I open God's word, every time I come to church, I show up midweek, I'm feeding my faith. I'm hearing God's word. The second thing is remember this. God is with us. God is with us, isn't he? You remember the story of Elisha, 2 Kings? Elisha was giving the king of Israel information prophetically. And the king of Syria, which has always been an enemy of Israel, was thinking there was a mole in his camp because, man, every time we try to attack Israel, they know we're coming. And he says, we got an enemy right here, a spy in our own camp. And one smart young man says, no, no, no. That's not the deal. They have a prophet. His name is Elisha. And the Lord allows him to see, and he tells the king of Israel, and that's how they know. Well, the king of Syria said, let's go get that man, that prophet, and let's kill him today. <laughs> so Elisha has this protege, this young man who's like an armor bearer, a guy that worked with him. And all of a sudden, the Syrian army completely surrounds Elisha and his dwelling. And Elisha is chill. He's probably making coffee. He's not sweating the, the servant keeps going and peeking out the window and he's sweating, his hands are shaking and he's going back, do you know what's happening out there? And Elisha says, no, doesn't matter. Where'd you buy this coffee? <laughs> he's going, so finally Elisha says, Lord, this, this kid is way too anxious and way too over-concerned. How many of you have ever been too anxious, too over-concerned? Me too. And Elisha says, Lord, will you open his eyes? The Lord opened his servant's eyes. And the Bible says that when the servant could see that the hillside had so many chariots, so many warriors from heaven, that when he saw it, instant peace came over him. He goes, oh, now I know why you're so chill. 
Let me just say to you, he who is with you is greater than the storm you're going through. He who is with you is greater than the enemy of the world that we live in. And though you might be going through some storms, you're going to make it through. You are an overcomer. I declare over you, you are unshakable. You're going to make it. Hebrews 12, 28 says, do you see what we've got? My prayer is that you see. That's why I keep referring to the, the mental image, the mind movie that comes from understanding God's word. Do you see it? It's invisible. No, you can't see it in the natural. But by the eyes of your spirit, do you see what we've got? An unshakable kingdom. And do you see how thankful we must be? Must is a word of requirement. You are not, it is not optionable. You and I are required by God to recognize the goodness of God and to begin to be thankful. I'm so thankful for you. I, I just want to tell you how thankful I am. For, I'm thankful for all of our volunteers. I'm thankful for our children's workers, our nursery. Thankful for our ushers, our greeters, the bookstore people. Thankful for our coffee shop people. I'm thankful for you. Thankful for all of you online and on Facebook. I love you. I'm going to choose to give my attention because he goes on and he says, we brim over with worship as a result because we have a deep reverence of God for our God is not an indifferent bystander just watching from the side going, I hope they make it. No, no, no. He's encouraging you. Even this day, I, I pray you hear his voice saying, come on, get, get back in the deep water with me. You're going to make it. You're an overcomer. You're victorious. Come on, begin to see it. Begin to say it over your, over your own life. Begin to say, I have confidence. I am a man of confidence. I'm a woman of confidence. I am assured. I'm going to make it. I do overcome. I overcome every day. I've got great attitude. I'm thankful. I'm grateful. No whining on my part. Uh-uh. Trust in the Lord. Are you with me? Yes. If you believe that, you just received that today. Get back in the deep with us. Let's work.